Welcome back to the last 10 days of logic with Carnades.org. Today we are going to be continuing with answers to our final logic problems. Today we're going to be looking at answers to our beginner set of problems. If you don't remember what those are, here they are right now. If you haven't had a chance to try to work these out or try these on your own, I'd suggest you pause the video now and do that because we're going to be revealing the answers in the rest of the videos. If you were completely stumped with these, I would suggest instead of just watching the answers, going back to the 18 rules of inference videos and watching those so that you can really come back to this and be able to do these on your own. I would really hope that you're able to at least do most of these problems or get most of your way through these problems on your own. The first two you should do without conditional and indirect proof, and the last three you can use conditional and indirect proof to do them, okay? With that out of the way, let's get started. So, the first problem that we have is P implies Q and R implies S. It's not the case that Q and S. Therefore, it's not the case that P and R. What are we going to do for this? Well, what I see in the first premise is a nice, juicy conjunction. The great thing about conjunctions is we can split them up and get new premises. That'd be the first thing I would do. Premise 1, simplification, P implies Q. Premise 1, simplification, R implies S. There's not much more I can do just with these premises right now. However, if I look at premise 2, I see there's that nasty negation outside of parentheses. There's not much I can do when the negation's outside the parentheses because it doesn't let me split up the terms inside or really do that much. So we want to put that negation inside. We want to distribute it there. So we're going to use De Morgan's rule to distribute it to the Q and the S to get not Q or not S, premise 2 De Morgan's. And then because disjunction really isn't something that can work well with implication statements, I'm going to go ahead and use implication to get Q implies not S. Now that I have this, there's a bunch of different ways you could solve this from here. What I'm going to do is first to transpose that to S implies not Q, then set up a hypothetical syllogism to get R implies not Q. Then we can transpose our original premise 3, not Q implies not P, and then set up another hypothetical syllogism, R implies not P. We can do implication to get not R or not P. Switch that around so it's going to look exactly like our conclusion with commutativity. And finally, we will finish with a De Morgan's rule to get it's not the case that P and R. It's possible that you did this a different way. Maybe you saw the hypothetical syllogism earlier and got P implies not S and then transposed R implies S into something else. You might have been able to do it in less steps. As long as all of your steps are valid and you've got the conclusion, good for you. This is just one way to do it. The next problem is P implies Q, R implies Q, therefore P or R implies Q. This would be really easy if we had conditional proof and constructive dilemma, but we're not allowed to use conditional proof right now, so let's take a look at another way to do this. What we'll do is we'll take P implies Q and we're going to turn it into something we can use a lot better, an implication statement, not P or Q, premise one implication. We'll do the same with premise two. Then we're going to go ahead and conjoin them. Why will we conjoin them, you might ask? Well, there's a Q term in both of them. What that means is we can use distribution to end up with not P and not R or Q. Whenever you have two negations on one, either side of a conjunction, you can use De Morgan's rule to bring that negation to the outside. It's not the case that P or R or Q. And if you remember implication, if we're denying the first term and we have a disjunction in the middle, we can just switch that into an implication. To P or R implies Q. In premise 7, implication. And that's our conclusion. Not as hard as it might have seemed at first. Now we're going to move on to the questions we have to do with conditional or indirect proof. There may or may not be a way that you can do these without conditional or indirect proof. For now, we're going to do them with conditional and indirect proof to see how that works. So we have P implies Q, P implies Q implies R, Q implies R implies H, and we want to conclude P implies H. Just looking at this argument, it should be pretty clear that this is going to be a valid argument. Going all the way down, P implies all of the things that one would need to get H. 
The cool thing about this argument is you only need two rules of inference to solve it. You need your conditional proof, of course, and you need modus ponens. Once you have those, you're just going to use modus ponens over and over and over again and get your solution. Let's see. Assume conditional proof, P. Draw a line going down. We get Q from 1, 4, modus ponens. Then we get Q implies R from 2, 4, modus ponens. Then we get R from 5, 6, modus ponens. This is just so fun. Then we get R implies H from 3, 4, modus ponens. And then we get H from 7, 8, modus ponens. Finally, we then have P implies H from 4 through 9, conditional proof. Next, we're going to be doing the following problem. P or Q implies R and S. S or T implies U. P or T, therefore, U. We did the last problem with conditional proof. This one we're going to be using indirect proof not only to have some variety, but also because since we have a singular proposition for our conclusion and it's not a conditional we're trying to get in our conclusion, conditional proof doesn't really make sense, and indirect proof makes a lot of sense. So we'll start with denying U, assumed indirect proof, and we'll draw a line going down. Not U is going to allow us to use modus tollens on premise 2, which will get us, it's not the case that S or T to form modus tollens. Whenever you see a negation outside of a pair of parentheses with a disjunction or a conjunction inside, you should think De Morgan's rule. That's what we'll use to get not S and not T, five De Morgans. We'll then simplify that down to not T, and then use disjunctive syllogism on 3 and 7 to get P. We'll also simplify 6 down to not s. We'll go ahead and add not r to not s. Why would we do that, you ask? Well, because we know we can then use De Morgan's rule. To get it's not the case that s and r tend De Morgan's, and then use that to go backwards up premise 1 through 111 modus tollens to get it's not the case that p or q. Once again, whenever you see that negation outside of a disjunction, you should think De Morgan's rule. We'll use that. We'll get not P and not Q, 12 De Morgans. We'll simplify that down to not P, premise 13 simplification. We'll go ahead and conjoin 8 and 14 with conjunction to get not P and P, which is, of course, a contradiction, meaning we are done with our indirect proof, and we can conclude U from 4 through 15 indirect proof. Finally, we're going to take a look at kind of proving a truth of logic. This is a little bit different than some of the other problems we've done before, but it's something that's important to know how to do using indirect and conditional proof. We have P is materially equivalent to P or Q and not Q. If you think about this, it should make sense as a truth of logic. What we're going to do, there's a couple different ways you could solve this. You could have started with an indirect proof and just denied the whole thing, or you could have seen that that equivalent sign, it just means it's a biconditional. So if we can get both P implies P or Q and not Q, and P or Q and not Q implies P, we are going to have ourselves a biconditional. We'll have the two halves that we can then conjoin and turn into this final conclusion. The second route is what we're going to be taking. If you did it with indirect proof, great for you. I think it's a little bit more complicated. That's It was a little bit more complicated when I tried it, but more power to you. So we'll start with P, assumed conditional proof. We'll draw a little line going down because it doesn't take much to get the other half of that. All we need to do is premise one addition. We'll add on Q and not Q, and therefore conclude P implies P or Q and not Q. One, two, conditional proof. Pretty simple. Then we'll go ahead and assume conditional proof P or Q and not Q. Draw a line going down. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do a tiny little assumed indirect proof. And that's going to be the assumed indirect proof of Q and not Q. This only takes one line because in the very first line of our assumed indirect proof, it's clear that this is a contradiction. So we can easily deny it's not the case that Q and not Q. Some people might make you go through a little bit more of like separating them out and then conjoining them again. I'm not going to worry about that too much. It should be clear to everyone here that premise 5 just is a contradiction. Then we'll go ahead and be able to conclude P from 4-6 disjunctive syllogism. 
That way we are able to conclude P or Q and not Q implies P from four seven conditional proof. We can then conjoin lines three and eight to get P implies P or Q and not Q and P or Q and not Q implies P. Premise three, premise eight, conjunction. The cool thing is we can actually also just, to simplify things, write line three and line eight. This isn't a notation that I've used much. It's a notation that you will see out there, though, so I wanted just to mention it here in our final days of logic to show you it's something whenever you have two really complicated lines that you are putting into a conjunction or you're putting somewhere and they've been stated enough, you don't want to have to write again the whole length of that. You can just write line 3 or line 8 or whatever line it is and put it in those kind of curly brackets to signify that. It means the same thing as the premise 9 I put above it. And finally, just through the rules of equivalence, we can conclude P if and only if P or Q and not Q. That was the answers to the beginner problems for logic. Next up is the intermediate problems. If you didn't check them out in the original video, check them out here. Write them down. Give them a try. Tomorrow we'll be taking a look at the solutions to these problems. Working with instantiation and generalization, change of quantifier, and conditional and indirect proof for predicate calculus. We are getting so close. That was the first part of our final logic problems and answers. Once we're done with the intermediate proof answers and the expert proof answers, we will have one more final day of logic, and then we're done. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at Carnades.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.